Yeah, the the whole point of like motivation, inspirations for this, you know, to actually go through two years of writing process was my only wish and hope is like it will at least, you know, change um hopefully um some minds and some hearts like back in Australia so that because uh, I still have friends there like who are going through their ninth and their tenth years in detention. Um I would have been there like if I were not to take things on my own hands. So my only hope was I think if it was not the case, I would, I would be less likely to actually write it because I wasn't convinced that anybody would be able to relate um, to the experience. So I was hesitant, but at the same time, I got to be the voice because I have to use it while my friends are still inside. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this episode of Different Boat, Same Storm. You may notice here that we're actually joined by our same guest as last week. Uh, we realized that, that the story of Javeth when we were talking to him was so powerful uh, and so amazing that we needed to draw this conversation out and get more details. We ended last week with the story of Javeth being on Manus Island, uh, being in this detention center and how he actually planned to escape. So today we'll get all into that. Um, Javeth, thank you so much for being back and continuing your story with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for picking this up back. Now, Javet, as we were talking the last time over, and you were mentioning what brought you to the brink of desperation to the extent that you were willing to literally dive head first into the water, something that you were so scared of, um, then face the alternative of having to go back to Burma or moving to the high facility prison. And I, I just want to, I think I, I want people who are listening to this story to appreciate that level of desperation where, where you're willing to, your worst fears, your worst possible fears also seem muted in comparison to your other alternatives that have been forced upon you. Just such are the circumstances that a refugee has to go through. And Javed, I know you've preambled about your plan being very outrageous and something you weren't too sure about panning out. I personally am very curious and I'm sure up here and I'm sure all of our audience is very, very curious as to what exactly was this plan? Right. So it wasn't the getting out of the detention, um, getting out of the prison was relatively easier part than what actually went through beyond the gates. Um, the prison itself was actually upgraded during my time there. Like it became from barbed wire to, you know, um, double fans, like with uh, sometimes charge fans. Um, and a lot of other CCTV and sensors and all those sort of measures um, during my time there. So it wasn't just a prisons anymore. It was like, you know, thoroughly um, planned out, thoroughly monitored. And the prisons was not just the only, the only entity that was being monitored, but the whole island. And the only way out of the island was um, to get on a plane. And the... The airport was patrolled by the same guard who patrolled the prison. So literally zeroing the chance of anyone unauthorized, like unapproved, getting um, out of that, um, that airport gate. So to me, it was very audacious in a way that um, I didn't expect it to success, like for the person who actually planned it. I don't think it will makes sense to anybody who didn't plan, who didn't, you know, wasn't involved in the planning process either. So I wasn't sure, um, I wasn't confident like it will work out, but I didn't have anything to lose. The other alternatives were like even worse. And if the worst of the worst at that time could be, I was being put in a solitary confinement, which I have already been a few times for making, you know, um, just for the sake of recording stuff. Um, so it wasn't necessarily um, a big thing for me. For me, the longer, the dying of hope, like 
getting day in day out going through the same torture process which which probably pages long um i wasn't just trying to put up with that and die there which also bring me to the point of why did i made you know all this journey just to end up here it's just it's just not justifiable like i went through so much of this boat journey 50 50 chance of life only to rot here like that wasn't what I expected. Like I deserve something more than this. But at the same time, day to day, the detention was actually getting worse. Like the prisons were expanding, the um, the government was getting harsher, and there were like forced deportations of the um, of other refugees. And I had a friend from Vietnam who who got killed like literally two weeks after he was being sent back. So like there was a lot of other um, pressure point there to make escape at the same time. I didn't have a single information like of anything, how the system operate, how the guard schedule work and how, you know, um, what is the protocol if this happened and what is the distance it take for a guard for me to be able to find like all those sort of things. I didn't have like an, um, like an insider help or like I got access to, you know, randomly to some sort of these information. It's like I didn't have any of those on my hands. The only way, and this is where the prison break show came in, was um, when I didn't, when you don't have something I learned, I pick up from the show was like when you don't have access to, you know, um, information that you need, you can always observe it, note it down. About three to four months, you have a pattern to work on, and you have like quite confidence of the probability of like which will happen when, and like the margin of error, like how long it take for a guard to reach fence A to fence B. And if you are one was missing, how long it take? Like once you note down the every nitty gritty details of like up to six months, you have a pattern like to work. You have a, like a pretty good picture of how it's look like, how the procedure, how the routines work. And um, that's where it started. I just like start noting down um, things around six months. I have like some things to work out from there where I figure out um, the only demographic like I could um, fit in where so the prison was so remote in the middle of nowhere that they have to flew in and flew out of out of stuff like from Australia mainland and these people like would fly in for every three weeks and get off uh, on the fourth weeks and spend in Australia like even they can handle like you know more than three weeks and one another, uh, the other, since this is more of a friendly, uh, the other, I, I'm going to say the joke, the other joke, dark joke that we used to have was like, because those people work on the weekdays and doesn't, doesn't work on weekend. And we used to joke like, um, you know, the only wish we have was to have two weeks, two days out of like torture on the weekend and then like resume the same torture, like on the weekdays, you know, you at least have a break. That was the only wish that you had uh we had back then anyway jokes aside um yeah so i figured out the only demographic of the staff members that i would be able to fit in were healthcare workers like where they tend to have a lot of um people that are much more closer to um to me in a way like shade of skin your look and other features and the other one was um interpreters like not everybody spoke english so like they used to brought like interpreters to interpret for different languages we were talking about um 22 nationalities in that prison so you had like a lot of other um interpreters flying on and then i i don't know when the interpreters fly in and the interpreters fly out like so i would go to you know interpreters like hey uh you know when did you fly in good to see you like when did you came like and then when you repeat it like for a few times, you know, you have a schedule it's like when you're leaving, like, so I know kind of like their flight out of the island. So work right from there. And I have to um, get some sort of normal clothes, like that would look like an interpreter. So I, I was able to camouflage um, some of the part of the uniforms and get a, get a, get an ID, get a fake ID um, and get on the plane happened that I were I was able to work out the guards like who were most of the time this really um 
ex armies like who were working as a prison guard by then uh, after their career in the army so they were like you know really built buff like i'm no match so uh, there was no way for me to be able to camouflage with them so i um i was able to then the healthcare workers like the uniform was much more harder to get access to than the interpreters which was much more of a basic light blue color um uniform so i was able to get my hand on it and i work out interpreters um healthcare workers and the uh, guards but i didn't have access to immigration officers who were working most of the time behind the scene so we don't need to, um necessarily have a lot of contacts with them and on the same plane there was two immigration officers like that was supposed to be a flight and then a few minutes later on the plane i got there was like actually guard like who were providing security for the immigration officers that came out like so that was one of the that was another uh, another one of those moments where i said like i'm done like this is fucked up i'm done i'm going back but you know i i push all of my nerves down like try to stay calm and like just push a little bit more further and then like you know i i just remind myself i'm an interpreter so like i i made the flight so that's how i actually got off the out of the island wow wow I mean the suspense has been building and building and uh, like this wasn't just something that you did last minute it involved months and months of planning and uh such careful planning too I mean you observed schedules you saw uniforms you saw who was the most likely that you could access like all those things like uh Javet you said the day of then you, you, so basically you got the uniform of the interpreter you were able to get in it and then just leave the prison i mean on the day of your actual escape how did that work step by step i mean it's it's just so fascinating that not only did you have the uh the determination and perseverance to continue with this despite the challenges that you talked about but that it actually all worked out what was the day to day um or the, on the day of what was the step by step process actually like yeah i think the immigration was just you know like life you can't plan out everything and there will be always something to surprise you and i always used to say the only my only motto is like expect the unexpected like that has been consistent pretty much in my life as till to this day um so i was hoping for something unexpected but not that expected back to your questions on that day on the very um on the very um day the day before i have to get out of the prison and at that point what happened was the prison was actually ruled unconstitutional by the by the high court so we were like illegally detained for the last 4 years at that point like it was an it was unconstitutional by the land of the law to detain someone who hasn't done any crime and we were just being locked up for the last 4 years and we were talking 4 years of like in people their late teens to like early where you know their prime years where you could have been making your um your career moves like your study and you were taking prime times out of there and my friends are still for their ninth year there like they, their life is like literally they're between 20 to late 20s are like done there so i had to get out of the island uh, out of the prison that was relatively easy because the the prison was ruled illegal so they can necessarily shut the gate The problem was the prison was built inside a naval base. And the naval base is like, you know, once you step out of it, you get trespassing charge and like you it is a it is it is restricted naval area. So that's why I was saying that the way that the, the Australian government was boasting the prison was open, they are free. Yes, free to lead to another criminal charge. That's how the a lot of politician used to deceive and even if you manage out, and then the solutions came up like the, the the government will provide the buses out of the navy area but the locals were you know um there were propagandas again um, against us with the local like they were this were people um dangerous enough that they have to be locked up in the inside the naval base so like you know the the it's normal very natural for the locals to assume you dangerous and um not to treat you well So it is like out of the fire out of the frying pan back into the fire sort of situation. Yes, we were free, but it was actually worse than free once you got out. 
somehow, uh, I, wouldn't, I won't go into details because it will take up more time. I had to get up the night um, before because I was giving like some sort of rooms in case something happened. So I get up the night before I, um, the first thing I did was like deactivate all my social media because we were, all of the communications were being monitored like from the inside. Sometimes we would tell stuff that will be picked up by the guard before we act, the other person actually read your message. So they were like such sort of, so I deactivated all my social media, basically, you know, kill all my digital footprints on the island. And I logged into this, um, a chief motel, like the only thing that I could find there. And I couldn't sleep the night because it was full of cockroaches. And my only fear is like, I hate anything more that has more than four legs. It's a like nightmare for me. So like they were crawling all over. So I literally slept, like not slept, just watch um, stars. And when you, in the middle of the island, in the middle of the sea, the stars are like, probably the best thing that you could watch it was just no pollution no light pollution so um pretty clear so i ended up the, uh, spending the night watching the stars the next day when actual flight came uh the flight came down which was um supposed to be 145 but you know when you are in a situation the flight has to be late so that it will raise up your anxiety um the flight was late and I had a friend who had to help me out take out the boarding parts because I couldn't go on board, take the boarding parts out. Like they will recognize. So there are like other plannings that went through underneath the surface where I have to um, get my age short of like one year of actual my age so that I will fall under minor. And a uh, someone else is able to collect the boarding parts if they're for minor. So like there were like other size sort of um, small de smaller details um, which went through. The time when the flight actually landed, we went in. The plan was to join the line of boarding people quietly. And the first mistake I did was I was trying to join in quietly and um, I ended up cutting a line. So there, I have like all the attentions of the people who were in the back of the queue. Though there was like a little bumpy started, but somehow I managed. Um, it was not too much of um, distractions, uh, not too much of an attention um, from other people to, not to be able to let me on the plane. When I got on the plane, then, then I had surprises of like two immigration officers and followed by a guard, a prison guard in his literal prison uniform, prison guard's uniform. Even worse, the guy came back, sat just behind me. And he was making a conversation to me um, that uh, about the flight being delayed. Yeah. But anyway, I, I just put on my headphone, which was again, I didn't have headphone. Like you don't have headphone in prison. It's like I had this headphone just not to listen to music, actually, just to deter people not to talk to me. So I just put the headphones on and wow. just pretend, no, I didn't hear him. And then you flew and, away. Yeah, and the flight took off. Like that was, uh, that was relieving. Wow. And, and so w actually, yeah, wow. I mean, that story, like it's literally out of, straight out of a movie, uh, like straight out of a TV show. Wow. Wow. If I may ask you just like, one last question on this when that flight finally took off what did you feel guilty because i was i was leaving I, I wasn't able to tell any of my friends that i am actually escaping sometimes it is at least in the in my context it was better for me not to tell anyone what is happening more than they need to know because it was, I am putting their life in danger for knowing such things and not reporting. And I'm putting my life in danger in case they end up talking to somebody. So I received help, but I wasn't able to tell any of my cellmates, you know, uh, who were crucial of helping me out. Um, and also I feel like uh, 
You know, you feel once you live in such close proximity, much more crowded than dorms. Like, don't even, uh, I don't, I won't even go into details. So you kind of develop this bond where you, we were living in a condition where we're like we survive on the, on the guarantee of like the other cellmate got your back. So like you were like codependent in this sort of um, environment. So when I was leaving, I felt like a coward, like not being able to help them, let alone help them even tell them. So like I was feeling the precise, the exact um, feeling was I was just feeling guilty um, when I was overlooking the whole prisons from the air, which was like just a white cleared ground with shipping containers um, from the air. I wish I could feel happy. I wish I would. Uh, I could feel excited, like finally to get out of that shithole. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. tough at that time, and and, and you know, I, my first instinct was, as as anybody's instinct would be, that of course you'd be happy. But this, the guilt that you talk about survivor's guilt if i may put it that way is it's very real that even if the pain that you were going through was a collective pain and having that having it be alleviated on an individual level but yet know that the collective is still undergoing that pain it, it somehow just makes it worse if i may not on a physical level again but on that mental level where even though you are physically out of the place, mentally, a piece of your heart is always going to be with them wishing that they find peace and that they're, they're able to be as lucky as you have been in, in getting out. Yeah, the, the whole point of like motivation, inspirations for this, you know, to actually go through two years of writing process was my only wish and hope is like it will at least you know change um hopefully um some minds and some hearts like back in australia so that because uh, i still have friends there like who are going through their ninth and their tenth years in detention um i would have been there like if i were not to take things on my own hands so my only hope was i think if it was not the case i would i would be less likely to actually write it because I wasn't convinced that anybody would be able to relate um, to the experience. So I was hesitant. But at the same time, I got to be the voice because I have to use it while my friends are still inside. And um, going through the same pain is still this very day. So that was, that was partly motivated by the guilt or survivor guilt, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. And that's so commendable. Gift yeah. Of that guilt absolutely like that's so commendable wanting to do something for those people and you know javette uh, we've been talking for so long and we've appreciated this conversation so much as we start to wrap up here your your journey of escaping um you know not just escaping though from that that prison but your entire journey of you know fleeing your home country because of genocide and uh, sinking in boats multiple times and just you know, so much unpredictability, so much human tragedy around you. And, and fortunately, you were able to get to Canada at the end of the day. Can you talk a bit about what that journey was like, that final portion of the journey getting to Canada? And I know uh, you, you said you landed on Christmas Eve. Uh, what was that entire experience like? Well, after taking off the Manus Island, the plan was to get lost somewhere in the wood um, and, you know, until disappear, until things calm down, maybe find a way. But again, nothing ever happened as I expected or as I hoped. So, so like I was, um, I had to take multiple detour, like, and I spent like for the next six months in the Pacific from Vaughanville to, uh, to Solomon Island to um, a few other places down there. And when I was trying to get out of the Pacific at all costs, because the more, the far I go, the more I realized that Australian government's grip was still there. These island nations were treated like, you know, um, penal colonies, like around the, around the Pacific. So I was trying to get out of the influence, but something else to add to the misery was like, um, 
I didn't have any travel documents back from Burma or citizenship because the whole um, ethnicity was de um, determined as a uh, stateless. Basically, you can get any travel documents or passport from there. So I had to get somehow a travel document on my hand to be able to get on a plane, which was not domestic anymore and I couldn't trick. So I have to master the language and I have to, you know, camouflage again um, with as a Solomon Islanders and to go through in them as a mixed race to history lessons and all of that, like which eventually took me six months. Finally, on the late December, when I got um, my hands on a travel document, just literally when I gave up, I actually wrote to my helpers back then, um, supporters like, I'm coming back to the detention because I had nowhere to go and I can't float around. Like that's when I got the travel document. And I was looking through anywhere I could go to to add to the misery was Solomon Island was such a small nation. Um, it doesn't have an international flight. The only flight they have out of the island was one is to Australia, which is a no-go zone. The other one is back to Papua New Guinea, where I was detained of the nation. So the two were ruled out. The other was Fiji. And with the Fiji, there was a guy before me who tried to escape, make it to Fiji and was sent back from the Fiji. So all literally all three options were blocked. Knowing that I chose the least riskiest options and chose Fiji, uh, Fiji. you know, um, no joke, I was detained there. So there was the scenario. And when I did finally get out of the detention, I, I joke again, um, I, was try, I was trying going to this Airbnb motel. Um, the taxi driver somehow think I'm Indian and then like he keep talking to me in a Fijian version of Indian. And then I was like, Dude, I just need some a few hours of sleep so that like you won't talk to me. But I get out of the Fiji. Oh, I, oh sorry. Why Canada? Uh, the Canada came up as an option because um, Solomon Island happened to be uh, a Commonwealth island, uh, a Commonwealth country, like you know, belong to this group of Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, and. With Commonwealth passport, like you can kind of try have a less visa restriction to a few certain countries. So um, Canada happened to be one of them. And I also realized Canada didn't require an in-person interview. So it was like a online forms and you have to tick. Like, so I just basically, knowing that the decision was granted like literally a few minutes later, I thought it got to be some sort of programs or algorithm behind it. So I just tick just the right thing that will grant me a visa so i just like even though i was literally a runaway i was employed in certain things and that like so i got a i got a what they call eta electronic travel authorization for canada and i said okay why not canada um even though i don't know anyone i don't know anything um let alone the weather um i took it and um the problem with, so I, I got out of the Fiji. Back in Fiji, I was detained because my passport was too new and I don't look like anywhere Solomon Islanders. That was the case. In Hong Kong, they wouldn't let me get on the plane. This was another transit again. Uh, they wouldn't let me on the plane because um, I don't have a luggage. Like, I'm running away. How, how else do you expect me to have luggage? And because I don't have money. Um, the, the worst thing was I didn't have enough money to buy two-way tickets, so I could only afford a one-way ticket. So that was a red flag again there. And, um, and again, to, the same thing with the flight was delayed about six hours. My anxiety kicked to the, you know, sky. Uh, and finally, you know, going through all the typical dramas at this point that has become a part. Uh, I was able to board on the plane, um, which was an Air Canada flight. They let me board because I was the only one holding the, the plane at the gate. So I end up, um, I end up in Toronto Pearson Airport like on a Christmas night Eve randomly without knowing anyone. And um, so I went through their paperwork and all. And uh, it, was the, it was the immigration guy like who was interviewing me saying, uh, don't go out on this shirt uh, because we are not prepared for the weather. It was like Christmas Eve and it was like snowing heavy and I had no idea, um, especially when I was coming, you know, on Manus, it was most of the time the temperature is like 40 degrees Celsius around, like, and 
equatorial heat, like that was the only prison on Earth which is only two degrees below equator. So it was burning hot, like we, most of the time, like I don't think we wear clothes just because the heat is intolerable. And when you live in a shipping container with no proper ventilations, you know, you can, I would, I would let the imagination do the work. But uh, here I had no idea like the work could get so cold, like it was bone chilling cold, like on that night. And the uh, immigration guy was like, no, don't go out. You're not prepared for this. That was the beginning um, in Toronto. Wow. I mean, the I, it's funny how we've come to a point where that entire Hong Kong segue was just said in passing. And I, I'm not going to go into that because I think we've had you being detained is almost, it, it, it almost must seem like a norm now. I actually um, came to Canada yeah. with that detention in mind. Like I'll be gonna, I'm gonna be detained when I get there. And yeah. then the immigration guy was saying, if you hold a document that's not under your name, um, by default, like by protocol, you are ne you need to be sent to a facility, a detention facility until the background clearing check is done. I said, okay, that's not a surprise. And then the the guy was saying, like, but knowing what you have been through, I'm just gonna let you go and get some sleep. So. No, that's one of the points um, I discuss with people whenever they say um, rigid rule in institutions, but in every institution, in every rule, there is always, you know, um, elements and gaps, like you could insert humanity and see the other person as a human being, not as a random passport number. There's something so beautiful that you just said there that, that, that I do want to hone into, that even in these nebulous institutions that seem like they're built to oppress, and they are, clearly from your experience, they are. What can make the difference is a human acting like a human rather than a cog in the wheel and looking at you and treating you like a human, like they would like to be treated themselves. Like the man, has, the immigration officer said, it's cold outside because he knew what that would be like and he didn't want you to go through it because he wouldn't want to go through it himself. That, that all, all it takes is humanity. All it takes is empathizing with somebody else's grief, realizing that you couldn't possibly imagine what that would be like, but the least you can do is extend a hand, extend that olive branch. Yeah, my, my experience has been that that pretty much summarized like it is always an institution's haunting me down on the, on, the, on the other end there is this one individual taking a chance on a stranger who he never knew he or she never knew before and um, it is just the humaneness of like this our collective you know um, being as a human being, seeing the other person as a fellow human being yeah. without any filter, without any lens, um, you know, without any smoke screen. That was yeah. pretty much the whole sum up of, uh, the whole summary of my entire experience. Again, uh, I'm just, I'm in awe. Uh, Javed, you're, you're, you're a funny person. You're so positive. And considering everything that you've gone through that, like again, resilience, it's, it's kind of a buzzword and we've talked about resilience a lot on our podcast, but your story is that embodiment that, you know, there were more tough times than good times yet you've come out of it. And, uh, you know, as again, as we wrap up here, uh, th that final portion of your journey now coming to Canada, I, I know that you slept at homeless shelters for a bit. Uh, you were able to now be at the University of Toronto and you've written your book, have, having a book deal with Penguin Random House. I mean, all of that, that final chapter of your journey and where you are right now. Uh, how would you describe that entire portion at large? I think the, um, the thing that made difference was I became accustomed to the uncomfortableness. Like you became comfortable with the uncomfortableness and you started to expect the unexpected like so when the odd you know the odds are a stack against you you kind of don't um you kind of see it as a as something 
pushing you to get on a higher level like you're you just can you're able to overcome it otherwise they won't be there in the first place and not to take down every down like as a whenever you're let down like there must be something there must be i don't know what it is and i still don't know like whatever it is like trying demanding from you a little bit harder maybe a little bit more input a little bit more push that's demanding from you and you just try it if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen like don't take it personally or it's just you know um in the in the bigger scheme of thing it will stand like two to three percent of your failure but that also how you overcome that defines how your um the next challenge that those are the only two models that i can think of like from the beginning to end that has been consistent for me so far where always suspect the unexpected and um get comfortable with the uncomfortableness the rest would do itself how you act in the face of diver of adversity is a true testament of the strength of your character uh and, and your grit and, and your actions in those moments define where you will be in the future that that's what i'm seeming to get as well and i couldn't agree more if, if i may ask i mean of course it seems like canada has been very different clearly than all of your other experiences but coming to a place finally where there seemed like there was there was hope that ever elusive light it was present it, despite being in a country where you are as foreign as you could possibly be how did you go about building a life for yourself here because you were I think more than anybody else you can say this in its true sense you were starting life from scratch yeah from the from the actually from the very bottom literally and metaphorically and literally because when i end up in the homeless shelter because there was it was winter peak of the winter there was nothing so i was like literally on the most on the bottom floor of the of the shelter without you know uh much rooms and um uh, without much heat so it was literally and metaphorically from the very bottom but so far it has been it is not easy i would say there were a lot of things that were only you can only see from a you can only see from an intersectional point of view like when being a person of color is merged with a recent immigrant merged with not having family merged with someone who didn't have a legal status like those sort of a lot of things merge and then it is a complete new things on its own than individual challenges and all of once you have to figure out all of these challenges at the same time while trying to make you know a career alive at the same time it is it take like some it take like some um some strength i would say uh, it de- it demands some strength and i've seen also a lot of other um immigrants and a lot of other refugees who were caught up in this rat race where you kind of end up in a survival jobs and then because you have to do the job you can't get out of it and you need the job so that you can you can uh you can do other thing because you have to do the job like sort of this sort of rat race and um a lot of things and i was uh i was being rejected on a lot of other um jobs i applied like i was i was finishing my um uh, um uh, industrial chemistry back in burma i was in training when the genocide exploded um so i was being rejected on the ground of not having canadian experiences like and all those sort of um you know typical token that were thrown in your face when um you go and apply for a job but again um it take some strength and there the other thing is there is always a work away around whatever the wall is there is always a work away around and just um find that tiny gap and hopefully that gap expand wide enough for the next generation not to be able to face the wall and you're here right and what you said like i love that so much that you not only care about again what you've gone through in overcoming every single one of those barriers but 
uh, the next generation and the people that will come beyond you. That selflessness in that regard, it's just so commendable. And uh, Javet, like, what what are your hopes and dreams for the future? Not just for yourself, but for the world. And as you navigate this period of life where you're you're in your career now and you're learning and you're in Canada, what what are your hopes for the future? My biggest hope is um, to put end to a lot of human-made disaster, like genocide. These are not something natural, like a like a storm or like a like a flood. And there are a lot of things that imaginary drawn borders, you know, um, economically ripping off other people's of artificial money. You know, there's yeah. sort of a lot of human, a lot of our disaster that we are working. Uh, I love love to work, but like human made yeah. even the natural one are like exacerbated like by the human made factors so i would just hope we develop some common sense and um you know work this thing through before before it goes over the picking point and the next generations don't have to face you know what we fucked up with absolutely and again not just your book but, but your life is your message uh, of there always being a workaround to whatever walls you're faced with if you have the courage to surmount them. And also, if you have this, if you display the resilience that you're able, that you have displayed at every step of the way. And all I can say is I'm inspired. Uh, I am, I'm in awe, I'm inspired and I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation today uh, and, and that we, that we met. I remember at the time we met, we, I had no idea about the story. I'm sure now that I'm thinking of it, the time with the timelines and everything, the book was already in motion, I imagine. And it's, it, it's, it's crazy to me, even right now, as we're talking, that you can go through life and meet and engage meaningfully with so many people around you and yet be gloriously oblivious about their lives, about their stories, about their past and their present and what the future holds for them. And yet all it takes is somebody to show interest, somebody to reach out, somebody to care enough to see you and the people around you as human, as more than just a number, as more than just a statistic, but as living, breathing human, just like you and I, sharing this space and wanting the same things in life, the, the most basic, things in life, not privileges, not extrava extravagant luxuries, but just comfort, safety, freedom, and hope. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's even the case when people, among the people who hate each other, like one of my experience, um, I, during my first few months, I was um, I was renting a, a a basement back in Waterloo, um, where the guy was, you know, not the most friendly person that you want to go, but um, he was like he was a Trump supporter, like a hardcore one, and I didn't know why he gave me the room in the first place. Maybe because I was willing to plow the snow at that time, and that's the cheapest I could find. So I end up taking it, but when I spend a lot of time back in the room studying, like he kind of get irritated, but, and you know, a lot of nasty things that he would say to my face. But at the end, when I was leaving, we became so close that like he was saying me, don't go if you don't have the money to pay for the rent, just stay here free. And at one point he was saying, oh, um, he would, he, he was like, deeply also influenced by a lot of Islamophobia and whatnot when he was saying to me, oh, you're, um, 
you're the most nicest Muslims I've ever seen. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not a Muslim, at least not anymore, but in the, uh, in the conventional sense. And he would say, well, then you are the most nicest brown person I've ever seen. Uh, he was just literally asking me to stay with him in the basement. And this was the same guy who was hating me from the beginning. So yeah. even some people like who were hating each other and not really get along, once you get to know the human elements underneath the surface that um, the filtered news through, med through media and all the other um, lenses, even racism wash away and, yeah. um, you know, and humanity reveals. Humanity reveals. I love that so much. That's such a beautiful message to end on. Uh, Javette, thank you so, so much for this amazing conversation. We've talked about everything from your story to human rights and the refugee crisis and every issue intersecting in between about hope and inspiration and overcoming adversity and humanity uh thank yeah, you so thank much you. yeah thank you thank you guys i hope it's not too deep oh the deeper the better that's just the way we go about things here i i, I do have to say thank you so much uh, javette i know this is a really really busy time for you especially with your book, Escape from Manus Island, just being recently published and out and about. And I know you're a very, very busy man. So we really do appreciate you taking time to talk to a bunch of naive 20 year olds who from your perspective are incredibly sheltered and just be honest, candid, and so joyful to speak to. Folks, this has been possibly one of the most life-changing episodes that we've ever had of Different Boat, Same Storm. We'll be back again next week, same time, different guest, different boat, same storm. Bye, guys.